gurus, let's pay homage to the lineage gurus. Homage to the venerable Mang Liao Ming. Homage to Master Sakya Zheng Kong. Homage to His Holiness the Sixteen Kamapa. And homage to Master Dukden Torchi. Homage to the Three Jewels of the Altar. Homage to the main deity of the good practice tonight, the savior of the natal world, Siddhigarbha Bodhisattva. Often during the Dharma practice, like in practicing Siddhigarbha Bodhisattva, wearing the five Buddha crown, with Buddha's light, Siddhigarbha Bodhisattva, Buddha's light radiating all over the right hand is holding the staff to break open the gates to hells and the left hand is holding the bright pole to radiate upon the ten Dharma realms. And he is riding on the uh, Di Ting, just the listener, to provide salvation upon hearing suffering. The Siddhigarbha Bodhisattva with the greatest vow. So I often perform such visualization. So Tansum Kat So City, all Dhamma Masters, Dhamma Educators, Dhamma Teachers, Dhamma Lecturers, Dhamma Assistants and directors of temples and chapters and all disciples present here and over the internet. How do you do? I still. Shalange. Hola, amigo. Que quiero mucho. Skoin. Ichiba. Kimochi. Jumi. Yapi. Brim brim, kong bang wa. Jintian wo men tong xiu di zhang wang bu sa. So today, we had the practice of Siddhigabha Bodhisattva, and I did explain how to describe Siddhigabha Bodhisattva. Many bodhisattvas have their pets, and Siddhigabha Bodhisattva's pet is called Di Ting, which is, which is uh, an animal, a beast, who could listen uh, with supernatural power. So, this beast would be able to know all things that happen under the heaven. So, by having this Di Ting as his pet, he doesn't have to move around and he would know what's going on in the world. So, that's the function of this beast. 
and his right paw, his right hand is holding a staff. In the past, a monk would have his own staff. It's one of the uh, implement that they all they have to shake open the gates to hell. And his left hand is holding the bright pole. I often use the bright pole in my visualization. It flies through the sky and it's all radiant and descending and I feel cool and clear all over my body and it's for blessings so he's not riding or seated on a lotus but instead on this animal called a bee team. Oh, like the listener. <laughs> we have explained about Siddhigabha Bodhisattva many times. And Siddhigabha Bodhisattva spiritual center is the Mount Jungho. And the clear and cold mountain mentioned in the sutra is Mount Utai in Sansi province. That was mentioned in the sutras. And the others, like Mount Putuo in Zhejiang province, Mount Jiuhua in Anhui province, and Mount Ermei in Sichuan province, that belongs to Samantabhadra Bodhisattva or the spiritual center of Samantha Bhadra Bodhisattva. And Mount Utai is the spiritual center of Manjushri Bodhisattva. And Mount Buddha Loka is the spiritual center of Avalokiteshvara Bodhisattva. And Mount Jiuhua is the spiritual center of Siddhikarva Bodhisattva. They are all in China. So, Mount Jiuhua in Anhui province is the spiritual center of Siddhigarbha Bodhisattva. And the pioneer, the first patriarch who opened the center was called Jin Chao Jie, a monk from Korea. So it's an ordained monk from India, uh, from Korea. <laughs> and I just joke that he might be the ancestor of Kim the president. Because Kim is a very popular last name in Korea. <laughs> like uh, the major family names in Chinese, Chen, Chen, Chen and Lin would occupy half of the Chinese. So the brother masters were all Chen, and Lin is also a major last name. But like Grandmaster Lu is most, it's not that many, it's less. So people with last names Chen and Lin occupy half of the Chinese or China then. So Chen and Lin are the most.
And in Korea, Kim is most popular. So he established the Siddhigaba Bodhisattva Spiritual Center. Of the four uh, Buddhist mountains in China, I only went to Mount Wutai, the Manjushri Bodhisattva Center. But in my out of body travel or soul travel, I have visited the others too. And before the Dharma teaching, I would first like to share a few jokes. Uh, talking about uh, a customer that that get the, uh, a bus, a tour bus, and then he tap on the shoulder of the driver, and he, the driver jumped in surprise, and then he said, "I'm oh, sorry about that," and the driver said, "No problem. Just a small misunderstanding, because." I just started uh, driving, uh, actually a taxi. Only recently, in the past, I was driving the the um, hmm, the funeral cars. Of course, as a driver of uh, the funeral cars, it would be very shocking to have someone tap on your shoulder. A Chang told his friend, I want to get divorced. My wife hasn't spoken to me in two months. Please think carefully, the friend said. Nowadays, it's really hard to find such a wife that doesn't speak for two months. Because most wives <laughs> because they're always exercising their mouth. They would talk a lot. <laughs> they can talk for two hours on the phone. In the past, they, they use phone, and now they use handphone. <laughs> And then they said, oh, my hand is sore, let me rest. And then they just place the phone on the table and then they continue. If Grandmaster speaks on the phone, I will not talk for so long. I would only say the, the key points, and that's it. I will not talk too much, just on the key things, important things. <coughs> Other than the only time I talk about the only time I talk for so long is when I give Dharma teaching seated on the Dharma throne. The plane was flying calmly, and the pilot announced, Ladies and gentlemen, I'm your pilot. Will come on board. And I would like to tell you, ah, oh my God. And then the announcement stopped. So all the passengers were scared that even the 
flight attendants. And it was complete silent in the cabin. And after a while, the pilot was on the announce, uh, on the speaker again. Ladies and gentlemen, <laughs> sorry to shock you. Just now, when the flight attendant poured the coffee and she poured it accidentally on my pants, if you don't believe it, you can come and take a look, it's wet. So one of the passengers were really angry. <laughs> What's so big deal about your pants being wet? Why don't you come and look at my crotch? <laughs> to look at my... So he peed in his pants. So now, back to the topic. Question and answer. <laughs> Malaysia Lianhua Xiao San <laughs> Xiao San in Chinese sounds like a mistress. <laughs> you know in Chinese we call mistress is the little the third party. You can call yourself the little, the fourth or the fifth, but not the third. This is how you pronounce it. Wholeheartedly pay homage and gratitude to the lineage of Guru, His Holiness, if you put my family member has compulsive hoarding, so our house is in a great mess. There are piles of stuffs in each room, so mice are everywhere. We have lived in this condition for over 10 years. Recently, I work hard to change the situation, but my own effort is limited. I ask for help from other family members, but they either reject it or just help a little bit. So we are back to zero. Recently, I learned to practice Dharma, Chan Sutras, and Mantras, repent and dedicate the merits to remedy this situation. But I'm sorry that the outright home is also in this chaotic and filthy environment. It's impossible to generate respect because I can't even have the most basic cleanliness. One, I want to cultivate spiritually, but in this messy environment, how can I practice well? How do I make my mind to overcome the environment and not the environment overcoming my mind? First question. Second, I once heard Grandmaster said that Golden Mother told Grandmaster not to save people born in the second and eleventh lunar month because they have heavy karma and they are born to suffer in the human world. I was born in the 11th month, so am I hopeless? How do I transcend this kind of problems or karma? Okay, for the first one. You 
家里有没有囤积症？囤积症的家人。Any of you here have someone or a family member with compulsive hoarding? They, they just they don't want to throw out anything. They keep all kinds of bottles and containers, newspapers, shoes, any old stuff. They don't want to throw away anything. Like broken chairs and tables, they all. They collect them all. Even when they get on bed, it was there were there was piles. There were piles of stuffs on the bed, and before they get on bed, they have to make space. And the bathroom, the bathtub, is filled with stuff. And when you walk, you have to. They're avoided. You know, in my feng shui consultation, the wife, when she goes out, she's beautiful and attractive. But when I went to their house, oh no. There are all kinds of stuff, shoes and newspapers, everything. And on the dining table, there are lots of stuffs. There are people like that. Any of you with compulsive holding? I know in Seattle alone there are several families like that with lots of stuffs. How can I check the feng shui this way? In early times, I did give feng shui consultation. Mr. Ma, who works at the tax department. I went to his house and he always looked presentable when he goes out and his wife too. I heard that she's a beauty um, contest winner. But as soon as I got in the door, there was almost no space to walk on. Stuffs everywhere. So that's compulsive holding. Because they think that everything is useful. So the house is very chaotic, messy, broken chairs and tables, even with three legs. Chairs with three legs, they still keep. So a disciple living in such situation, I'm very empathetic. And of course, on the altar too. Andy, which is Fo Qing's husband's uh, relative, a relative, and his wife, uh, no, his wife is a doctor. When they have a big sale, like say on Safeway, she, they would buy them, even if they're not yes useful. So when anything is on sale, they would buy all of them. And 
and his wife at the Bellevue Square, anything is like 50% off or anything on discount, she would uh, buy them all. So his, her husband especially bought a house for her to store all the stuffs. So he especially bought a house for his wife to store all the stuffs that she hoarded. They were all useless, whether they have uh, food or drink or to wear a shop or halic. So anything on sale they would buy even if they don't get to use them. So that's shopaholic. So at the end, they all garbage. So our disciples said, I want to cultivate spiritually, but in this messy environment, how do I make my mind overcome the environment and not the environment? Of my mind? You sit in front of the altar and you visualize the altar in the sky and yourself you yourself is also in the sky above the clouds beyond the heavens very nice and clean and clear sky and the altar is set up there and you practice on on a cloud, to seat it on a cloud. So that's a way. There's nothing else because the family members did not help, and there's so many things at home, all newspapers, all magazines, and even when you walk, you have to to kind of squeeze yourself in between. How about our dorms? Do we hoard things there? Are they tidy? They we cannot see anything. So as a military man, when they have the, <laughs> the patrol, like checking that on the bed, there should only be a pillow and a blanket um, folded very tidily and underneath it is a basin and a pair of shoes. A basin with uh, dental stuff and you cannot put anything else on it. It's very tidy and clean. So the ordained people, any one of you has compulsive hoarding, dirty and messy in your room, clothes on the bed, no place to walk on, master the way. <laughs> you should check on the rooms. Check who has this holding habits or inside the fridge. Very messy and stinky. You need to clean up all the old and rotten things. So Master the Hui should do the check, the checking and should get rid of all useless stuff. But the problem is they think they're all useful. But they think they are useful, but actually they are not. So things that you don't use now, you should put it on one side and organize it. I have seen it even among the disciples. It's really messy. All stuffs on the bed, clothes, uh, piles of them, and at night they would uh, 
put it aside, but then in the morning, again. So for the dorms, you have to check underwears that's not washed, stinky uh, socks and shoes. That's compulsive hoarding. <laughs> so let me tell Lian Hua Xiao San. So how do you practice in a messy environment? You visualize your altar to be beyond the heaven and you sit on top of the clouds and you start your practice. Then don't worry about this mess. I once heard Grandmaster say that people born the second and eleven lunar month, Golden Mother told Grandmaster not to save them. Why? And mentally ill. According to my experience, for mentally ill people who were born in the second or eleventh month, they are hopeless. If I see people with the second month or eleventh month uh, birthday, Golda Mother told me not to serve them. They have heavy karma and they are born to suffer. It's Oh, hopeless to save them. Even if you save them, they cannot be saved. And also mentally ill people who have been ill for over six years, it's the same. Uh, also, I was also told not to save them because their brain cells have died. Because they have heavy karma and they are born to suffer. I was born in the 11th month, so am I hopeless? But let me ask you, are you mentally ill? If you're not, then you, need, you don't need to worry. So of course, you have hope. You must not be mad or mentally ill <laughs> because your question is rational or logical, I mean, makes sense, but your name is Lian Hua Xiao San. So that's not a problem for normal people. If you're mentally ill, then that's not the case. Who knows? That maybe if you practice, then you will have attainment. But let me tell you, compulsive hoarding, that would be abnormal. See, someone bought a house just to store the stuffs that she hoarded and they didn't live in it. So it's a relative of Andy's, Andy's family. The doctor told me that uh, he especially bought a house for his wife to store the stuffs that she hoarded. So we refer to her as a shopaholic. So she had to buy when she sees it. That's also a kind of illness. So that's the, my answers to Lian Hua Xiao San from Malaysia. So if you're not mentally ill, there's no problem. Second question from Taiwan, Lian Hua Zi Hong. Okay, Master, I have some questions. I practice the nine phoenix filth elimination or defilements eradicating practice. Initially, I visualize them to be golden, but sometimes they become blue or other colors. Do these colors represent purification, enrichment, magnetization, or subjugation? Also, recently, when I visualize the nine phoenixes, 
appearing from the Golden Mother in my brain, the single-headed Golden Mother of Phoenix became multi-headed. Does it mean that the nine Phoenix want me to visualize them to have nine heads, or is it just my karma creating hindrances? Thank you, Grandmaster. Nine Phoenix Field Elimination Practice. The Nine Phoenix Field Elimination Ritual or Mantra is Nine Phoenix Soaring to destroy fields in all ten directions. The Golden Youth in the front leading and the Jade Maidens attending on the side. To pay homage to the Jade Emperor, all kinds of desecrations completely destroyed, as well as anything inauspicious. Your disciple earnestly pray to the Nine Phoenix Field Elimination General to descend from heaven. Spirits and evils perished. Celestial generals and officials come directly through the clouds. The stars move, the constellation revolves, marvelous ripples of the three lights. Command my talisman to purify the ten directions. Under the decree of the Golden Mother to please execute this command immediately. And this is the mudra. Outward claps. And one of the pinky is upright. And the rest are horizontal. This is the Nine Phoenix Field Elimination Mudra. So initially I visualized them to be golden phoenix, but sometimes they become blue or other colors. Anybody that has seen a phoenix? Phoenix is uh, a, f uh, a fable, a legend. There is no phoenix in the world. The same with dragon. Dragon is a, is a myth. We cannot see them. So she visualized them to be golden and sometimes blue are the colors. Grandmaster, do these colors represent purification, enrichment, magnetization, or subjugation? The golden phoenix, that would be for enrichment. That's not right. Because this is to eliminate filth or defilements. Golden phoenix? Do in this practice, do we have purification, enrichment, magnetization, and subjugation? No, it's not for those. So you should visualize them to be golden. If it's blue, then it would become a peacock. <laughs> So if it's blue, that would be a peacock. You should visualize them to be golden. No purification, enrichment, magnetization, or subjugation. It's a special one to eliminate filth. Oh, contaminants. So single-headed 
phoenix becomes multi-headed. So the nine phoenix, uh, they have nine heads. So it's fine to visualize the phoenix to be to have nine heads, but no purification, which or subjugation. So nine phoenix combined together, of course, then they have nine heads. But does Golden Mother have nine heads? Go ahead. <laughs> Go ahead. <laughs> Don't visualize Golden Mother to have nine heads. <laughs> Otherwise, people will start visualizing Grandmaster to have nine heads. But frankly speaking, it is not easy to visualize. It is hard, just, just one, just visualization is hard. Why? It's, we have to overcome it. It's also a kind of karma. Why is it like that? It's hard to say. In the past, when Grandmaster visualized, visualizing Golden Mother, and Golden Mother is not seated uh, straight, but sideways. Please, please visualize her to be right in front. How come I visualize Golden Mother, but why is she looking sideways? She's ignoring me. And I ask, are you ignoring me? And then she turned her back to me. Really, she ignored me. Oh no, what should I do? I had to spend lots of time to turn her around. Sometimes uh, visualizing the one <coughs> image <coughs> did not work, so I, I visualized another image or another one. And sometimes it's easy. As soon as I close my eyes, she appeared. And but the real golden mother that I saw was straight. But the golden mother up here, she's always looking sideways. She doesn't like to see me. I know, perhaps there's some problem. That's why she is not looking at me. And then, after a while, she would look at me straight. Then, okay, that's fine now. So this kind of things happen in visualization. But in any case, you have to visualize clearly that eventually you would be able to visualize properly. You have to train in visualization. It's really not easy. In spiritual cultivation is really not easy. So today we will talk about Vajra Chetika Prajna Paramita Mantra Sutra Vajra Prajna Paramita Sutra So Vajra is an ancient weapon in India and Vajra is indestructible This is Vajra This is a weapon in ancient India It is indestructible Do you believe it? And you throw it to the wall. It stays. It stays. It doesn't. It doesn't break. And then you throw it on the ground. It doesn't break either. It stays like this. So this is a kind of weapon in ancient India. So it represents the Vajrayana. So, 
we use this weapon to uh, symbolize the indestructibility, and that's this Vajra Sutra. And it is indestructible, so what is it for? Is to destroy everything. And that is also the Vajra Sutra, Diamond Sutra. So Vajra is the indestructible wisdom to annihilate everything. It's a sutra of the wisdom of the indestructible Vajra, Prajna's wisdom, to arrive at attainment. It's a sutra so it's called the Vajra Prajnaparamita Sutra. It's a very high attainment. So Paramita represents Mahayana. Paramita represents the un unparalleled attainment. So this sutra is a sutra of the wisdom of the indestructible Vajra that annihilates everything and arrives at the unparalleled attainment. Now, that's uh, clear, right? Let me tell you, from this sutra, I uh, related, or I thought of Kala Chakra. Kala Chakra, who transformed to be a Kala Chakra, that was Sakyamuni Buddha. In South India, at the auspicious rice gathering pagoda, Kalachakra transmitted to the king of Shambhala, King Suchandra. And Kalachakra, or the wheel of time, means the great wheel of time turns and nothing is uh, nothing can avoid uh, deterioration. Everything is destroyed. Everything deteriorates eventually. So houses, like Tantric Order, houses have a longer lifespan. Sometimes a hundred years, two hundred, a few hundred years in ancient building, ancient castles. But will they eventually be destroyed? Or yes, because after a long period of time, they will be broken. So the wheel of time will destroy everything. So the wheel of time, the real meaning of Kala Chakra or the wheel of time is the great wheel of time in the great wheel of time, everything will be broken. So houses will be broken. Human beings will be broken. How? Through time. You're born as a baby, and then child, youth, and middle age, old age, and then you die. And then you're destroyed. And what is it that make you destroyed? The wheel of time. Time. Amidst the time. Oh, 
们学这个物理。We learn physics. Seven hundred million years ago, the Earth had gone through what is called transformations. So the oceans become mountains. The mountains becomes oceans. Everything is destroyed. So amidst time, nothing exists. So Kala Chakra, the wheel of time, also annihilates everything. Also remember, Bodhidharma went to Tibet and he became then and his name became Dampa Sangye. When he went to Tibet, his name became Dampa Sangye. And Dampa Sangye transmitted to Majiklapdron a Dharma called sacrificing the body. So it's a dharma to cut, cut off, or cut through. So what is cutting through dharma, or dharma that cuts through? That's to destroy everything. So you cut your own head. Or Japanese would use harakiri to cut their own stomachs. They have three knives, long one, medium, and the shortest one. And the shortest one is when they lose or fail, they would uh, kill themselves by cutting their stomach. Harakiri. Harakiri. <laughs> I think it's called Shembu. I don't remember. My dad often talk about that. How do you say it? I remember my dad said it. Is it really Shambuku? It's true. I'm not kidding. Shambuku. So I still remember. I remember. It's called shambuku. My dad would uh, carry a very thick wooden sword, and then beat me until the sword was broken. <laughs> That's why Grandmaster had the bronze bones and iron body. And he beat me and the wooden swords was broken. So that's the Dharma of cutting through. So, Dampa Sangi transmitted to Magic Lakdron, the severance practice. And then you, you offer your own body to all the Buddhas and Bodhisattvas and sentient beings. So, that's the spirit of uh, forsaking and 
offering. So a spiritual cultivator has to have such spirits in order to have attainments. So in the exposition of the Vajra Sutra, you have to cut off thoughts of good and bad. Please don't keep them in the mind, whether it's good or bad, or big, middling or small issues, they all, you don't put any of them in your mind, then you wipe out everything. It's just uh, some people's small talk. And you're upset for three days. It's not worth it. Because you're a spiritual cultivator. Don't throw all this garbage inside your body. Instead, you want to take out all the garbage in from inside you. Money, career, romantic love, uh, familiar love, all precious items, including your own bodies, all should be cleansed completely. Be thrown out completely. Only then that is Vajra Prasna Paramita Sutra. Now do you understand the sutra? So a statement to make you sad for a few days, just a small matter, and you don't come anymore. I won't go anymore. I, will, I don't want to be giving Dharma teaching anymore. I'm not happy. I'm not pleased. So would that do? Anything, everything is a good thing. I have said it. Everything is the best arrangement. So even the best arrangement, there's still a matter. So you have to even uh, get rid of this, the best arrangement. So my exposition on Vajra Sutra is different. Even just the title, Vajra Prasna Paramita Sutra, I've talked about the title for so long, for a long time. So you chant every day, Vajna Prasna Paramita Sutra. Thus have I heard the setting of the ceremony. One time, the Buddha was at Jetavana Grove near the great city of Sravasti with an assembly of 1,250 monks. When it was time to make the alms round, the world honored one donned his sangati robe, took up his arm bowls, and entered Sravasti. Going from house to house to beg for food, after the alms round, he returned to the grove and ate his meal. He then put away his robe and bowl, washed his feet, prepared his seat, <laughs> and sat down. Do you know what Vajra Prasnya Paramita Sutra is? That's the wheel of time. It's the dharma of cutting off. It's to <laughs> cut off everything. What is romantic love? That's uh, SOB. <laughs> That's only for a, mom for a moment. At this moment, you have love. But once you die, what love would you have? So once you die, what kind of precious items do you have? What kind of houses and cars would you have? Once you die, you don't even have your physical bodies anymore. So in order for you to have an attainment, you have to get rid of even your whole, bo even your own body, completely. So career, love, fate, feng shui. Uh, astrology, the Buddha said those are all SOB. The Buddha uh, dislikes all those stuff. The one 
who knew Feng Sui was Sariputra, uh, one of his greatest disciples, the one with the greatest wisdom. Because living in the world, you use the worldly dharma to help sentient beings. Actually, they are useless. So what time is it now? 10. It's about there. Wait, wait. So today, I explain Vajra Prachnya Paramita Sutra and I explain it a little bit more clearly. It is related to the Dharma of the Wheel of Time. When the time passes, everything is gone. As the time passes, it is related to the severance practice, the practice of forsaking our bodies. When a person dies, everything is gone. Uh, just uh, everything, everything in the world is gone. When a person dies, everything in the world is gone. What kind of life? Life. I mean, love is all gone. This is all roughly. What kind of piano? Piano and sakura. So Master Lian Qing is called piano. And sakura is a Dharma educator. Lian Ying. Sakura. They're all gone. Sakura is gone. Roughly. Confucius was the first one that opened a mentoring or tutoring class, tutoring class, because he taught classes. So of course, yeah, he he had tutoring classes. So uh, this is also a play of words of Chinese idioms. So it's a joke explanation of Chinese idioms. So knowledge is that the student asks and the teacher answer and that becomes knowledge. So when you reach 50, you know about your destiny, but it explains us. If you pay 50 bucks, then you would know the questions of the exams. 60 is everything. Yeah. This is a joke, of course. So at 60, everything goes according uh, to wishes. So my dad's name is called Er Sun because when he was born, his father was 60 years old. So he was born. Was, so his father's third wife gave birth to him. He was already 60 then. And then he had six wives, and I heard that he had even many more mistresses around. 
，外面还有好多。那是我妈妈讲的，妈妈讲给我。她有。My mom told me this that he had six wives and many more outside. 所以我们这些后生小辈呀、啊， so his little descendant. <笑>跟大家开玩笑的。Uh, should follow the footsteps. It's just a joke. 这个讲一个健忘症的、啊，健忘症的。嗯、mm, ，Let's talk about amnesia. 老婆讲，我想吃冰激凌。The wife said, "I want to eat ice cream." Please go downstairs and get some for me. They were watching TV upstairs, and the wife said, "I want to eat ice cream. Please go downstairs and get me some, and please remember to put some strawberries on top." Ah, 换一颗草莓 Please, a strawberry. So, do you want to write it down? Otherwise. So that you don't forget. And the husband said, "Such a simple thing. I would, I would remember." And then, after a while, he got back upstairs and brought a bowl of noodle. And the wife got really angry and said, "What? I, didn't I tell you to add an egg on top of it?" Because the wife also forgot. She asked for ice cream. But it turned out to be a bowl of noodle, and she asked for the egg. 嗯，这个也是好笑。早上，小宝、小明赖床，眼看上学要迟到了。In the morning, Xiaoming just stayed in bed, and it was almost late for school. 巴掌，在他的屁股上面。And mom slapped him on his behind and called him. Come on, get up. And at this time, dad asked Xiaomi, "Do you want a new mom?" And Xiaomi said, "No way. Even the old mom is already." Already beaten me like this, and a, and a step mom. Oh, I wouldn't be able to live. I remember a joke, a poet, on the beach, looking at the waves and said, "Ocean, you're my mom." Oh, ocean, you are my mom. And a huge wave slapped his face, and he's all wet. And then he said, "Oh, mom, I use a step mom." Oh, money, pay me home.